ding dong, it's on. Yeah, this is the A building. Mm -hmm. It's the first floor, and in Norwegian that is second. And this is room number 18 on the first floor. So next time you search for a room in this building, it's either one, two, or that's it. Okay? Uh, and next time will be in 14 days from now on. <coughs> same time, same place. Uh, I cannot promise color version because now this has been standard. So it's only every time we change. Is that okay? Yeah, and we go. We are almost through the whole course. We have to have chapter 22 uh, because I have not seen the rally either this week. Although it was nice whether you can walk around with big banners saying 24. And I would have to copy something 24. It's not. Okay. Here comes the last group. Uh, I guess this is the private car group. So they should only have color, no, I mean black and white, but send back some color version till later. Spread it evenly around. Okay. Now you've been here for 12 times. And probably you have learned one thing. Trade is beneficial. And to make it sure it is beneficial, you need the system the monetary system that could help improve the conditions for trade. But for those of you interested in logistics or transport, you need also logistics <coughs> and transport to make trade work. But for the, uh, let's say, uh, outline of this textbook is just what can you organize around a market so it's working the way that it generate traits. And the answer is have more than one country so you can trade. Two, have a system with, let's say, a policy instrument that improve or help trade to be easy. Three, have a money system. Uh, and if you have a money system, you also need a monetary system. Uh, but before you leave, I'll tell you a short and brief history of Norway. It's about 1,200 years, and we will do it in three minutes. So if you miss one of the years, uh, send me an email. But Norway's history as a trading country has been quite long. And since none of you have a cousin in the UK, You are not angry with us any longer, I hope. Okay. Uh, but before we go into the Norwegian history, remember there are two sorts of Norwegians. The rioting ones are called Vikings. We, the ones on the west coast, are like the Dutch. We are the trading nice guys. So these are the two different. And we used to trade eight 1,200 years ago. Guess what currency we needed or used? Gold. Could have been. It was far more difficult than that. There is no gold in Norway in these days. So what can we offer is simply goods by goods and we call that... No. Never heard of barting or barters. You just trade goods by good. No money involved. Where should you go to trade goods? Because you're looking for other goods. So what you bring in is furs. We didn't produce them ourselves. We bought them up north in Russia. What could we, where would we go to sell furs? So we can get something in return. Not to Germany or Denmark, or Sweden, but to United Kingdom. Where in the United Kingdom would you try to sell your goods 1,200 years ago? The nearest uh, place. Yeah. Is the shortest distance between Norway and England. Yes. So it could be up north in what is called York. 
It's the, let's say, if you have heard of New York, that's newer than York, because York is, okay, yeah? York is, in fact, a Norwegian name. How do we spell it? You have to improve historic information for the Norwegians. The place was called Jorvik. It's almost like York. But you, your own, knows that the name of New York wasn't New York from the beginning. Amsterdam. New Amsterdam. Because the first one that came over were Dutch. Then came the English with the Norwegian background. And they call this, not the old York, but the New York. Because it's on the East Coast, in far, far up in the north, and there it is. So where do we go to sell our goods? that there is no money to somebody who has something to sell in return. And the easiest trading partner is the king, the court, or noblemen. So what we got back was po probably porcelain, if it was let's say, linked to China, but a lot of goods. So that is the background. It started as trading goods by goods. Is it easier to trade now? You will know when we have finished this lecture. Is that a fair deal? So the reason why we trade more now than 1,200 years ago, I will tell you before you leave 1455. Is that a fair deal? I mean, it's a Tuesday. You still have a day till it's Wednesday. But before you leave, I hope that you see why Krugman is so, let's say, hang up in the monetary system and the banking and financial markets. So far? Okay. Then we go. But first of all, no objection to chapter 22. Okay. And the last lecture, could that be a few days later than the Tuesday lecture? on the 22nd of April. So we have a sum up of the... Okay, so th those who are interested in a sum up lecture, let's say for two hours, we meet later than the 22nd of April. Those who are not interested, have a nice April. <coughs> we'll discuss the day on the 22nd, because I won't spoil your Easter vacation or the other extra lectures. So wait till then. So you have, if you have strong interest, in, let's say, in a Thursday, you have to form a group of two, four, six, eight, nine persons, so you have a majority. Or as they would have said in Hungary, make sure that the others are not here when you vote. And then you will have your decision, okay? Is that a fair deal? I mean, we can do it the Hungarian way or the traditional way, but we decide on the 22nd of April, when you know more about your future and what you have of extra lecture. Okay, 22, 22, 22 is on the 22nd of April. So if you wonder what chapter it will be next time, just remember the day, 22nd of April. Chapter 22. If there is a chapter 20, uh, 33, we have to drop it. You see that. Okay, here we go. The European experience. There are two ways to stimulate the economy. One is fiscal, which simply means you use the public revenue or public expenditure to, let's say, uh, influence the economy. So fiscal simply means using the public budgets. What is monetary expansion? You probably have learned when we started with chapter 13, I think it was. Lower interest rates money and by printing more banknotes you increase the money supply and then you can change the interest rate so that is 
the way it works. Why are the monetary market or the money market to the international exchange rate market? Okay. The whole idea is simply to increase the activity in the economy, increase the output, and change the exchange rate. If you produce more, and this is the test of the first lecture we ever gave in this course, what do you plan to do if you produce more is simply to export more, because you do not need it if it's not a growth in uh, number of inhabitants. So yes, we want more trade. So we have to influence the ex exchange rate. Why do we export more? Yeah, because there are more money in the economy. So we use part of it to produce something that we export because we want more of things that we do not produce and we call it import. And we started with importing French cheese. We have been through importing of German cars. So what are we importing now? What are Norwegians spending, or where are Norwegians spending their money in a market where you sort of trade now? As if I look around, see you in France, because I'm going to holidays in France. Or was it Bali? Or Australia? I've been to Australia. I would say go there if you have money. So make sure there is what we call an expense, uh, a permanent monetary expansion at home. So you get more money, go to Australia. See you in Perth, which is a town or an urban area in Australia. I've never been there, but I would like to go there. Okay, so we can use money on things that we do not have here. And most of what we lack here is sun, sandy beaches, warm afternoons, not too much clouds, less snow, things like that. So therefore we go abroad to consume it. So that is the effect of a, a permanent fiscal or monetary expansion. Okay? What are the difference between the two? Is if you increase the money supply, what happens to your exchange rate? if you can read loud, it gets depreciated. There are more money than, as a real value in the system, so the exchange rate is depreciated. Easier to sell, so we can buy more trips to France. Okay, see you in Cherbourg. Or if it's permanent fiscal policy, then you produce more, generate more income internally, and the exchange rate appreciates or gets higher. That means that the Norwegian students, if they want to go, for instance, to Germany to study, it will be more expensive in monetary or cheaper if it's fiscal policy. Do you catch that one? If we increase our monetary, uh, money supply, our currency gets a lower value. So it's more expensive for Norwegian to go abroad. So then we only come to Paris. We cannot take the train out of Paris. Okay? If this is because of what we call output exchange by fiscal policy, then our currency gets higher value, and then we can even drop by in Germany on the way to Paris, because we plan to see a football game in Eintracht. You know that, that it's a top division football club in, in Frankfurt. They used to have a Norwegian player there. Okay, so we have to go there. So every place that, where a Norwegian football player has been, once or twice, all Norwegian will go and see the place. So that's it. Okay. 
These are the policy instruments that can be used, fiscal or monetary. Let's say manipulate money supply or just produce more or less. So why did we have the European experience? And this is the last week chapter, also called chapter 20. It was to ease trade. Therefore, they wanted to have one currency. Uh, for those of you who have read chapter 20 once more, could they have come up with a better idea? The answer is either yes, no, or don't know. I think I would have, if you ask me now, at least, drop Portugal and Greece out till later to see what happens. But they decided to let them in to increase the area for, let's say, free trade, and they call this the single market. It's easier to trade in a market where you have the common currency. It's more difficult if you have to trade with somebody who wants euro if you are German, but wants krone if you are Swedish. So then you will look at you, go to the nearest bank and come back and pay. But this is not easing the trade. Okay, we have, before we leave, I think, and that's the reason why we're going to talk about Norwegian experience with trade during 1200 years in three minutes. It's simply this. Norwegian is not the best example Krugman could come up with. You have at least two hours to think it over before we conclude. Why is not Norwegian ex <coughs> experience the best example to prove a fixed rate to a common currency area? Two hours with two breaks. So you can discuss and come up with a conclusion. I think that is the problem of being an American textbook author. You know US. It's more difficult to know the places far out there called Europe. And if you have, uh, let's say, faint relatives in Norway coming over, they fly to Stockholm because they think that's the capital of this area. And if you ask where is Norway, they would say, well, I have relatives there, so it must be next to Stockholm. So therefore, I think his background is not precise enough to say that Norwegian example is the best one. Okay, EMU means... So that was the first decision of having one, uh, let's say, monetary system within Europe. And Europe in this sense means the European Union. They decided to have the currency in place in January the first 1999. They had already introduced a currency, but from then on it was Euro. <coughs> the idea was to strengthen the position in the world, because this is a very big market, bigger than the US. So probably the biggest market when you count in numbers. If you count in money values, I'm more doubtful. If you count in total numbers, China is of course bigger. But in 1999, there were not very many countries trading with China. So China as a trading area was less, uh, let's say, profitable than Europe <coughs> would be. So in these, <coughs> these days, EU is the biggest Western world market. They needed one currency and they had already decided to have one single market, the internal single market. <coughs> <coughs> if you can trade in one currency, it's easier to trade. It simply means if you go to the Norwegian food shop and try to pay with euros, have you tried it? No. Do you think it would work? No. Some <laughs> Uh, exchange rate. <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah, that is, yeah. Uh, if you go home, let's say via Copenhagen, 
don't shop in your home country's currency. Simply because you cannot do it more expensive than that. So therefore, probably you will <coughs> buy something in euros in Norway. Don't do it if you are not very hungry. Started with 11 states, ended up with uh, 17 now. The problem for EU is the development of the economies are different. If you don't believe me, call your friend who is now a student in Bulgaria and ask, does this look like France, Italy or Germany? And the answer is no, less developed than these three. So there are members within the EU area that has a very a less developed economy. So that is the problem on it. So is it within an optimum currency area? So then we agree. So at least two of us agree. That gives all of you a chance to vote against uh, the leading majority. But I think the answer is simply, for the whole area, not. But that could be an objection, then we can discuss it during the break. If you want to increase the money supply in the US, there is only one Federal Reserve or central bank. If you want to do the same in Norway, there's only one central bank. The difference between Norway and US is the number of inhabitants. We are five, they are about 300. Um, but uh, this morning I looked the uh, uh, movie, uh, uh -huh. Money for Nothing, uh -huh. and there were uh, also from every state, uh, Federal Reserve, uh -huh. and one Fed for uh, the US. So it, I, for me it looked like the same system in Europe. You got uh, Federal Reserve in every country, in every district, like Washington or what uh -huh. else, and even one uh, Federal Reserve for whole, the whole US. Yeah. So. But there is a small difference. Yeah, okay, if you want to print more dollars, they can only do it at the Federal Reserve in Washington. Nowhere else. So there's only one place where you can print out extra money. Do you think Germany would allow France to print extra euros freely if they could choose? For instance, to solve their internal economic so internal problems, no, not, no. A good, not a good idea. No. So they can do that in US, but not in Europe. So I think the basic idea is you have one printing federal reserve. And that is the point. So there is only one deciding the money supply for the whole economic area. Not yet for Europe or EU for one particular reason. Because would it help Sweden if you print out more euros? Denmark, UK. So some of these are not members. In fact, 11 are not members. So there will be money supply increase within EU under no influence of the central bank in Germany or any of the other central bank members of the monetary union. So that is the difference. You could say that if Sarah Palin had been the vice president of the US, they probably would have one up in Alaska, but I don't think so. But they can have one in Sweden, simply because they print out Swedish money and influence money supply within EU, but only in Sweden. <coughs> so are these exchange rate regime within an economy but it's hard to get stabilization, the best solution. I think you know my answer, but you will have a chance to discuss it. Okay? He picked Norway, found out that Norway had, let's say, monetary gain from it. Uh, it was easier to <coughs> trade. 
Why is it easier to trade is simply because if you have a euro, it's worth a euro, whether you pay for it in Germany or Switzerland, you pay for other monies because it's not member. But they are member, could have been member of the same year as we are. But in Norway, you have to pay with Norwegian krona, and then it's uncertain. And you are not sure what the exchange rate actually are. So that is problem number one. Okay, then you have to calculate, and you have to uh, pay for transfer of money, and it depends on where you get the money from. But if this uh, <coughs> are extensive, what was the difference between extensive and intensive? Intensive if, if you light, let's say, a lighter and put your finger on the top of it, it's intensive, but it, it hits one point and you can feel it probably. Extensive means it has a wide variety. It's not only one, but several uh, activities. So yes, the problem is migration. We discussed it last week, we don't do it this week because People can move freely in US, not in Europe. So it could have been better. It could be the US version. Can one day be? But there are four challenges. The labor market should be more flexible. The fiscal system is hard to get work because you have limits between, let's say, uh, deficits and GDP. Not working yet. Uh, it's also asking for a deeper political union, where you have one central bank. And that's it. So these are the challenges. Freer or more flexible labor market, one or more consistent fiscal system, stronger political powers to regulate economy, fiscal or monetary wise, and a stronger central bank. And I promise you that if you take me to the nearest restaurant uh, in my wheelchair 20 years from now on, and I still I'm able to see and talk and understand English. Then we can discuss this. But I'm afraid the answer could still be a little bit vague even 20 years from now on. OK? So see you in 20 years. I promise I have a modern wheelchair so you can uh, say, operate it from distance. But we'll have to discuss EU and the monetary system in 2034. And that is the next head of the central bank in Europe. It was a lady, wasn't it? No, then it's a wise chief of it. Because you know, there is something called the IMF, which is the International Monetary Fund that funds activities where there are no local banks. You know that they have a French head. It should have been a male French. But it is a female. So things are improving, girls. Don't worry. In 20 years' time, half of the board will be ladies. OK, then we are into the capital market and the financial system and the banking system, and the financial crisis, and some banks running into troubles, but that would be at the end. What is an asset? If you look around in this room, can you see an asset? 
and I hope you will come up with five examples. Let's start with the easiest one. Why is this an asset? Because I don't have to change it every year. So it has a value lasting for, let's say, a longer period. So it's just a value that I can use, let's say, for several periods. That is an asset, okay? Probably this is an asset, although we have nicer rooms than this. Still, this will be here, not in 20 years when you pick me up in the wheelchair, but uh, at least a few years from now. So that is an asset, okay? Are there more assets here that you can see? Do you see the camera over there? When you come back next time on exchange, it will be the same camera, but then on a fixed point. So it's an asset, you can use it for several periods. That was three, okay? If all of you turn straight around 180 degrees, then you will see an asset, which is a non, or could be speculative, but what is it? Why do you have a museum in the central Paris where you have things like that on the wall? It's simply, it is an asset. So it's, let's say, storing values that you can have, let's say, for future use. The most famous asset in Louvre in Paris is Mona Lisa. It's Mona Lisa, isn't it? Yeah. There are a few others, but I think Mona Lisa is one. If you cross over to the other side of the river, Seine, you come to uh, Musée d'Orsay. There, the assets are much bigger. Do you know why? They were painted later. Mona Lisa is probably the oldest paintings in museums in France. Probably. If you read French literature, you will know that there are also paintings like this outside museums, but you can see it publicly in France every day if you want to. Do you know what it is? Then you are no Christian. You don't go to churches. Okay. If you look at the walls one day, if you drop by, put your head inside the church door and look into it, you will see it. These are assets. So it, in fact, has a value for future use. And I think the, at least the churches was for non-speculative purposes. So yes, you can store values for future use. We call it assets. So it's a way to, let's say, instead of using it immediately, like Norwegian going to trade in UK, you can wait because you have available an asset that you can pay for, for future use. So that gave, ends up at number five. Where do you think that you are supposed to read this? Probably you will learn something of it, okay? If you learn something, you probably one day get work. Hopefully, I'm not sure. For all I know, between the group here is the future head of the European Central Bank. And that leaves us with one, two, three, four candidates, if it's a female head of it. So the asset is simply knowledge that you can use in your future work, and that will probably produce something good or a good. Okay? So see you in the nearest, let's say, market nearby the German Central Bank, where you operate a bank system that gives you a hell of a lot of money. Because if you want to earn a lot of money, start with the bank. Ask the Norwegian head of the Norwegian bank. And you know how it works. Okay? So that is also an asset. So we <coughs> differs the banking system where you can transfer let's say assets or money value is one. <coughs> you need it to pay for services or goods. So if I want to buy my cell phone, let's say in Ireland, I can use the bank to transfer the value so I get the real good, the cell phone. 
in addition, I get the services. Because if it's working, we don't know till we have tested it out. I can also use it for services. So one, you use it to pay for goods and services. Do you know what intertemporal means? That is when you go out on Saturday, run out of money, but want half a liter of beer extra. You ask the man next to you, say, could I lend you from you enough money to pay for the extra half liter? So can I pay it back on Monday when I got money? That is intent. Or you buy it now or you can buy it later. You buy it now, you can pay it later. So that's it. So over time, you pay now and get back later. And if I look at the Norwegians and say, have you heard of Norwegian oil and gas industry? Do you think they had the assets they needed to extract oil and gas when we started? Then I can also ask the other one. No. Where did we get it from? America. Most of it. What did we use it for was to extract oil and gas. Then we could pay it back later. So we needed the asset, the, let's say the equipment, we had to have it immediately. We could not produce it ourselves, but we could pay it back later. That is what we call intertemporal trade. Was it lucrative or worth the money to do it? The Norwegian are a little bit uncertain. Because now we have one million per Norwegian as assets placed around the world. And if I ask the Norwegian, they don't know what assets we are putting the money into. But you don't believe it, probably, but we own a building in London. Not all of it, but part of it. Why do we own a building in London? Which is an asset. Why do we want to put our money, not into, let's say, production in Norway, but in a building in London? No, but it is helped by the banking system. It's simply in the most expensive shopping street in London, Regent Street. It's even more expensive than Oxford Street. Why do we buy a, let's say, a shopping building in central London? It's simply because we think it's get more value in the future. So it's just put it into an asset which we think will increase in value over time. Okay? We also buy shares and stocks in French, German, Italian and other industries. Why do we spread it around? It's what we call risk management. Okay? So that is point two. Point three is we can buy assets with assets. Okay? Like we did, since the Brazilian boys are not here today. They buy the Norwegian version of the assets we got from the American. So we improve the asset so it can be used more efficiently, among other things. So yes, there it is. So there are three forms of trade, buy goods now, buy in the future, or just buy assets. A building in London. So if a Norwegian knock on the shopping inside this building, you say, you are in my house, I want discount. I think it wouldn't work, but that could also be one we <coughs> version of it. Okay? Asset by asset trade has a problem risk. If you don't know exactly the risk of the asset you are buying, you're running into problems. Uh, in fact, it was not assets in the let's say, standard version of it, but it was what we call derivates, which is assets that's put together with assets and that it's something different. We call it just produced a new or innovated.
financial instrument. <coughs> Why didn't Norwegians buy too many of these? Was they were probably well informed. One of my best friends from the study days in Bergen, uh, I think he, or <coughs> at least he organized a fund of 50 million Norwegian kroner. So before the crisis, I asked him, are you interested in buying these? And he said, no, I have not the faintest idea what this contents. We don't know what is inside. We know there is something inside, but we don't know what it is. Was it a very good thing to do? The answer now is, yes, do not buy this because you don't know the risk of it. So asset by asset could lead to a financial crisis. Not only that one, but this did. Why was it dubious? Okay, let's make this very short. If you own a house in US paid by the bank, and if you cannot pay back the loan, all you can do is just leave and say, okay, I have no money. This is yours to the bank, and the bank has lost its money. That is not repaid. Can you do the same in Norway? No. You are obliged to pay for the debt in the future, although you have left the house. So one day you will see a Norwegian student, a former Norwegian student you know, sitting in a tent nearby the nearest bank, trying to collect money so he can pay back the house he once owned. But now it's taken over by somebody else. So this system made it possible to lend money or borrow money. So somebody lended money to somebody who borrowed, who would not be able to pay it back, and then you have a crisis. It's different from the crisis in Spain, because in Spain you had the houses and not the buyers. In the US you had the houses and the buyers, but not uh, guaranteed paying back. So yes, there are different risks involved. What is a portfolio diversification? It's not something that you put in the packet, like this, or enjoy. What is a portfolio diversification? It's the million each Norwegian owns in the Norwegian fund. Do you know what a portfolio is? Okay. Yeah, companies, housings, you can even own a bank if you want to. Uh, yeah. So a lot of assets you can put money into. That is a portfolio. Why should a portfolio co in contain both assets like stocks, housing, and something else? And probably if you are very good at management, this one collapses, this one explodes. So the balance is okay. So far, so good. And then you will have two minutes to think over. Why was it wise for the Norwegian government to try to come up with a deal with the Swedish Volvo? What do Volvo produce? Cars. What we try to sell to Sweden was oil production. Why is it wise for a country that produces oil to buy themselves a car producer. Well, why is it okay for a car producer to buy an oil production? Two minutes to think it over. We call it diversification. If the oil prices goes up, what happens to the oil company? Gets more profitable. What happens to the car producer? Running into problems. But the mean is okay. Okay, let's turn it around. What happens if the oil price drops? Ooh, I don't want that oil company, but I have a car producer that will sell more and more cars. So that is a diversification where the profit of one company varies opposite with the other one. Okay? So diversification, simply spread the risk. Reduce it by, let's say, combining different assets with different profitable history, okay? Then you will have a third question, which you will have 15 minutes to come up with the answer with. 
Why should Norway then invest into knitting industries like, like knitting caps, sweaters, and sell it to German tourists or Americans? Why would that be wise if you earn your money from oil production? 15 minutes, turn off the blinking light, see you here, 13, 15.